The NCA is often seen as the UK's equivalent to the FBI, and I think that's a fair assessment, really. We've got a lot of high-caliber investigators and officers, and we do have that international reach. Unlike the rest of Britain's regional police, the NCA operates across the whole of the UK and abroad to target serious organized crime, including romance fraud. Between 2020 and into 2021, the losses for the UK in terms of fraud and in terms of romance fraud is in excess of £79 million. This explosion of cases means it's now a priority for the NCA. I have a number of deputy senior investigating officers. Catherine is one of those. What attracts me to the job is, it's interesting, no two days are the same. I enjoy solving problems, I enjoy solving crime. In January 2021, the NCA received a call about a victim of romance fraud. Worried that this could be the first of many victims, they investigated immediately. Romance fraud in itself can be difficult to investigate because often it will go unreported. People feel embarrassed, feel ashamed, when realistically these are victims of very, very cruel uh, crimes. We've been able to trace this victim and help them, but we were aware that our officers were in that victim's home and when they were taking a statement from her and she was still receiving messages from the fraudster. This is very much an organised network. This is not one person sat in a room with a phone. It won't work like that. It couldn't work like that. It's too persistent. It's too sophisticated. It requires time. It requires effort. It requires contacts because money's got to come in, money's got to go out, you've got to have identities, you've got to have the devices to undertake this, this type of offending. It does need a network behind it. Convinced this fraud was part of a much bigger criminal enterprise, they launched Operation Syncopated. These criminal organisations sell leads and manuals of how to manipulate multiple targets. Before more people suffered at the hands of this scammer, the team looked into the victim's background. She'd been widowed I think, a number of years ago. Her husband had died after a period of ill health, which is obviously traumatic for anybody. And I think she was a very family oriented individual that had put a lot of effort into caring for her family. And I think she'd reached a point in her life where this was her time now to go and find a partner. Her children were growing up and looking, you know, moving out. And I think it was very much that she was looking for that companionship that she hadn't had in a, in a long time. This was the perfect profile to target. Fortunately, the 60-year-old woman had kept most of the 80,000 messages exchanged in the year-long relationship. Investigators began going through all of them, searching for evidence of extortion. She goes online looking for a companion and she meets an individual called Tony Eden. This person tells her that he's working overseas on a project, so they can't meet which is a deliberate strategy. Not being able to meet meant there was no way the woman could verify who she was actually dealing with. The photos he was using were of a male in his probably his 50s, maybe early 60s. Pictures were of him on holiday, out enjoying himself, looking like he had a very comfortable lifestyle. That's a real person's photos that are having their identity used on a day-to-day -day basis. The team continued studying the messages. I think what we see often is that they will tailor their approach to, to each specific victim. I think this victim was really looking for companionship. She will have told him about the fact she's a widow. And I think they were exploiting that. It was clear the psychology underpinning this fraud was incredibly sophisticated and manipulative. You were probably looking at sometimes 100, 200 messages exchanged in a single day. Building them to think that this is somebody that really cares about me and wants to start a life with me. 
Dr. Elizabeth Carter has advised police forces on romance fraud all over the country. Fraud makes up more than half of all crimes. It's a billion pound industry and it's something that happens worldwide. When we're talking about romance fraud, it's something that hasn't really hit the public consciousness until relatively recently. And even then, it's seen as something more like a Del Boy crime, something that you know people fall for and not something that's very serious. It has links with human trafficking, sexual exploitation, guns, drugs, um, we were talking about money mules as well. It has massive far reaches into, into huge criminal law organisations. Looking at these messages, we can see that Tony Eden starts off by showing that he's really vulnerable. And this shows to the victim that this isn't somebody that's very experienced in dating. And that's quite important. It makes sure that the, the victim's guard isn't put up early on. He then goes on to say, you know, I enjoy your conversation. Uh, I'm looking for a woman that knows what she wants in her relationship. That's quite important because it's empowering the victim, but also showing that he doesn't want to be controlling. He wants to have a nice woman. Early on, it shows that he's setting up these expectations of her. So there is this kind of underlying warning almost, but it's framed as, are you going to be as nice as I think you are? The scammer was pushing the vulnerable victim's emotional buttons. His exploitation then moved up a level. So what he's doing is he's giving a little bit of himself. And then he also shows his commitment to the relationship. But the way he's doing that is by forcing her off the dating site, so making her not available to other people. What's particularly cruel about this is that they are in your phone where your friends and family are and there's an extra idea, this layer of trust that's involved. They can also access you 24-7 as well. What we tend to find is the scammer will want to get you off the dating site as soon as possible and will ask for your phone number or details that they can contact you off the dating website. The reason for that is um, dating sites are you know, getting increasingly um, adept at identifying scam profiles and deleting them. The deeper the team delved, the more intense the manipulation became. When she starts to feel a bit edgy about going along with what he wants, rather than her protecting herself, it's reframed as her not trusting him. We see this very often in, in romance fraud. Once they were off the dating site, the scammer made his first request for a small amount of money in the form of a seemingly harmless gift card. This is getting the victim to do something physical. And it starts with something small, scratch the back of the card, type in the code, take the photo, send it. And it ends up something big, go into the bank, pay this amount of money. Then he carries on directing the victim and then love bombing again. Because he's asked her to go and do something. He's asked her for this money in the form of this card. He's directing her. He says, just get it that way I told you. Thank you. This is becoming much more direct. Whilst the analysis of the messages was important, identifying the criminal behind Tony Eden was critical. We had two main lines of inquiry. One was the phone number that had been in contact with the victim. The other was the flow of money from the victim to a variety of bank accounts. We were able to follow that money and that led us to this individual. SRGA Bonahan. So we're then looking to build a profile of them. So um, does he, you know, what's his um, income? What, um, where does he live? Um, what I say, what does he do for a living? Um, we discovered pretty early on that he was unlawfully present in, the, well, that he was illegally present in the UK. The biggest challenge in the investigation overall was finding him and being able to locate him. That was challenging because he was so under the radar. Unaware he was now under investigation, the suspect upped the ante of the fraud by claiming there'd been a fatal accident at work. He's not asking her for anything. He's just setting the scene here. But it also evokes a protective response from the victim. I need to help. And that puts the victim in a position of control, really, and also a position where they can protect the fraudster. 
You know, with fraud prevention and awareness raising literature, that asking for money is the big red flag. He's not asking for money here. As soon as she starts feeling as though she's not in a, in a position where she's in control, the Forster gives her that control by putting himself in a much more, well, a perceived to be much more vulnerable position. Much like every aspect of this scam, the psychological games and manipulation were well rehearsed. He's really careful to maintain his part of the power play. He needs help, but he's trying himself. He's not completely helpless. This isn't someone giving money to a stranger. This isn't money out of the blue. This is an individual who is in love uh, with somebody that they've been dating. Following the romance fraud manual, the scammer suggested they could finally be together. So before it was he needed to have money so he could phone her. Then it was money so that he could sort out the accident that happened at work. Now he's talking about having money so then he can come over on the aeroplane. By the time the ask for money comes, all the grooming's been done. Then the fraudster dropped the bomb. Suddenly, he might not make it back. It's harnessing this flight or fight response where something has happened and your heart starts going and, and you can't think straight and, and you need to act quickly. The fools are quite often in, in these types of frauds. They cast themselves as very capable, very rich, very in control, but also at the same time, situations happen where they really need help. The bottom line is, it's not a good relationship. Whether it's fraudulent or not, if you're trying to protect yourself and they don't like it, that relationship needs to end. After months of inquiries, the team had more than enough evidence to prove a crime had been committed. With the suspect living under the radar, locating him was still proving difficult. We were struggling and then one of, one of my team did some work around. Um, one of the big breakthrough we had was we, we found his current personal phone number. The team did a lot of detailed work around that phone and the movement of that phone and was able to identify that a Bonahan was living in the south of London. Located at last, in July 2021, the NCA moved in for the arrest. He had three mobile phones on him. Um, the officers quickly identified that he had what we, we would call the scam device on him. And he'd actually just sent a photo of Tony Eden to somebody. So he was in contact with victims right up until the point of his arrest. Investigators searched Agbonahan's home and he was questioned. So the interviews were conducted by two members of our team and that was a that was a no comment interview. It didn't look like the team were going to get any information on the organisation behind Agbonahan. This is one individual, but there's a large number of people operating out there. It's a wide network of people. It does require a lot of support behind it. But they were able to crack his mobiles and what they found was shocking. Once we were able to download the contents of that phone, and uh, we found that he had con 1,400 contacts saved into that phone, which were all names, female names, clearly people that he'd met on dating sites. The scale of the deception was staggering. One of the victims uh, lost, uh, lost in excess of uh, 10,000 pounds. It's a significant amount of money. One had actually died and had been terminally ill and he had been aware of this and he continued to ask her for money, even sending her messages after she died. In total, Agbonahan conned women out of around £20,000. 
and the grandmother who helped bring him down lost all her savings, ended up in debt, and had her heart broken. At the trial in central London, Agbonahan pleaded guilty to all charges. He was sentenced to 28 months in prison. Just, you know, I was, I was really pleased um, because, you know, the work of the, the, work of the team um, and it, it, it was really satisfying. It was a success for the NCA, but their fight against romance fraud continues. There will be a lot of people undertaking this kind of criminality now. Um, and it's about, for, for people who do engage on, on dating websites and things like that, it's just being mindful of um, thinking about what, what, who are they engaging with and speaking with friends about it. Um, talk about your, uh, what's going on in your life. Between 2020 and 2021, 11,148 kilos of cocaine was seized in the UK. But when over 100,000 kilos is thought to be consumed in Britain every year, it's an ongoing battle. When international organised criminal groups are involved in smuggling, the NCA takes the lead. I'm the branch commander for the National Crime Agency office at Heathrow. We deal with and work closely in collaboration with partners such as Border Force and Immigration Enforcement. But we are focused mostly here at Heathrow on drug and firearm importation. A lot of our work is sensitive. It might include surveillance and other specialist capabilities, which I'm afraid I can't discuss any further here. On the 30th of April 2021, the NCA got an urgent call from Heathrow Airport about a passenger from Ghana. The on-call officers who were on duty that day were provided information from Border Force that they had stopped a passenger um, and within that passenger's bags, they found 15 kilograms of cocaine. The NCA immediately put a team on it. This particular operation was assigned to John. John continues to work undercover, so his identity needs to be protected. Border Force intercepted a passenger by the name of Eric Apaya, who was a Ghanaian national. He wasn't known to law enforcement in the UK. As the officer searched through the back, she found a package which she pierced, which showed a white powder. That white powder tested positive for cocaine. Eric Kupaya was arrested and cautioned. Now, this was a significant amount of cocaine seized, estimated at 15 kilos. 15 kilos of cocaine has a street value of around five and a half million pounds. Due to the size of the um, cocaine seized in this case, it was evident that there was going to be an organised crime group involved. OCG involvement immediately escalated the seriousness of the case. The NCA launched Operation Ghana and began investigating Eric Appiah. So the information, firstly, that we're looking at is, although this passenger isn't known to UK authorities, we want to know, is he known to the Ghanaian authorities? The checks came back and he was not known to the Ghanaian authorities. This appeared to be an OCG operating on an international level. The NCA turned to their global intelligence links. The Ghana Narcotics Control Commission uh, worked very closely with the NCA to ensure that we tackled uh, those people that, uh, that threatened the, the borders and safety of people both in both countries. Investigators felt confident Apia was no more than a courier. Two weeks later, and it looked like Ghana's NCC had more gang members in their sights. They were secretly filming a male and female suspect while sending a live feed from the Accra airport. Now, as the surveillance is going on, this is being fed back to us as a case team. Another significant observation they see is the male passenger going through the female passenger's bags. Now, 
we see the male passenger moving items from one bag to another. At this point, we do not know what are in those two bags, but what we do know is that our intelligence suggests that the male is significant to our investigation. Both passengers were bound for Heathrow and the NCA waited for the flight to land. So as the plane lands, the Border Force team are waiting at the gate. Using the airport CCTV, the NCA communicated with Border Force officers to let them know who to stop. What CCTV captured and what the officers noticed was they came out of the flight separately. The male passenger is stopped by a Border Force officer. So we've got the first objective met. He's then asked, are you travelling alone? He replies, yes. Convinced he was smuggling cocaine, his baggage was searched. They've gone through the bag and they can't find it. There's nothing in there of customs interest. So what happens next is, although they've searched the bag, they then swab it. That swab tests positive for the traces of cocaine. The male passenger, Albert Gamafi, was arrested. Officers then moved on to the female. Shortly afterwards, we see Jennifer. She's intercepted by a Border Force officer. She is also asked, are you travelling alone? And she replies, yes. The officer removes the contents of the bag, and as she lifts it up, she notices there's an unusual weight to this empty bag. Now, the officer's experienced enough to know that that's not right. She then looks deeper into the bag, starts cutting it. As she pierces it with a knife, she can see there's a brown package. Now, as that's pierced, a white powder is revealed. That white powder tests positive for cocaine. The female passenger is then arrested and cautioned for being involved in the importation of controlled drugs. It was a good result. But now the team needed to work out Gamafi's role in the OCG. Judging from the surveillance footage that we was given by Ghana and the arrest of the female passenger, our initial thoughts was that the male passenger was acting as a minder. So his role really was to make sure that they got through the UK end and he was responsible for directing afterwards. Gamafi had four mobile phones on him when he was arrested. What we found was, on the images, two baggage tags which related to the initial subject, Eric Kupaya, who was arrested on the 30th of April. Those baggage tags correlated with the bags that contained the drugs. The connection confirmed the NCA's suspicions about the seriousness of this criminal operation. With the amount of drugs that have been seized so far, this was a large-scale organised crime group. With three OCG members in custody, investigators continued trawling the messages and data from the seized phones. Judging from the voice messages that we listened to, we knew that they were losing a huge commodity. They did say that they are losing money. So we're taking the drugs away from them. So th this is a good start. We've also got a minders mobile phone data. And as we're going through that, we're learning more about this organised crime group. That in itself has a lot of intelligence about how they're working. So th this is a bonus for us. Of all the evidence on the phones, one image stood out. As we go through the second passenger's mobile device, we've seen a copy of a passport in his image section of a male called Julius Puplumpu, Ghanaian National. We are then notified by our colleagues that Julius Puplumpu is due to arrive in the UK in August 2021. On the 19th of August, the suspect arrived at Heathrow. So we decided to detain Julius Puplumpu. I've then escorted Julius Puplumpu into the um, customs examination hall. As I empty out the contents of the bag, I lift it up, and then there is a weight to that bag. I've pierced the bag, and a white powder is shown. That white powder tests positive for cocaine, 
I then arrest and caution the passenger for being involved in the importation of controlled drugs. The haul of six kilos of cocaine had a street value of over two million pounds. Investigators' first port of call was Puplamplu's mobile. As we were viewing Julius Puplamplu's mobile phone, he was in correspondence, text messages, phone calls previously to the people that we'd arrested. We had all their phone seized, we had all their numbers, so it was quite easy to put that together and we could tell that they'd been talking to each other. Julius Puplampu had also shared an image of the first passenger when he was arrested. When this was first reported by the NCA, that article was shared from him to the other people involved. Now the NCA had four members of a Ghanaian OCG in custody. They studied all the phone data to help prove the suspect's place in the gang's hierarchy. Eric, the first passenger, we, we deemed as a courier only. Julius Puplampu, the third passenger, he was the courier only. Jennifer Adjaman, the, the female passenger, she was the courier. Albert Gamphy, the second passenger, we didn't accept that he would be a courier only. We believed that he was the next level up, which would be significant. Now to fulfill that significant role, we have to show that he's got some type of management function in this OCG, that he's leading others, and that he is aware of how the OCG operates. Finally, when the cases went to trial in London, the NCA gang's roles were all accepted. Couriers Apia, Adjumang and Putlamplu received six years each. Mid-level OCG member Gamafi was sentenced to nine. This was an excellent example of working with our overseas partners in Ghana. In my 20 years, this is the first time that I've obtained surveillance footage from Ghana. That footage really assisted our case. This has taken drugs worth approximately one and a half million pounds uh, wholesale value off the streets of the UK. So taking them away means hopefully we're reducing crime overall, and that's what we're here to do. Smuggling migrants by organised crime gangs is a global business, thought to be worth almost £10 billion a year. A popular route used by OCGs is by boat, and migrants arriving in the UK by small boats let from 8,000 to 28,000 people in 2021. It's a major issue for authorities and top priority for the NCA. I'm a senior officer with the National Crime Agency. The National Crime Agency covers the whole of the UK, but we also have officers that are placed around the world in various key overseas locations. We have to work with local police as well as international partners in Europol, Interpol, as well as police forces that are based in various overseas locations. At the time that I was doing this investigation, I was involved in organised immigration crime. That's bringing people into the UK illegally. The NCA's focus is stopping the unscrupulous gangs who put profit above everything else. The conditions for the people coming across are pretty horrendous. This is part of the issue with the organised crime groups is that they don't care how the people get across. And I'm sure everybody's read in the news about people that died trying to cross the channel or died in the back of lorries trying to get into the UK. In November 2020, intelligence came in about a boat suspected of carrying illegal migrants. I was in the office and I was told by one of my senior managers that this is a big investigation that the NCA were taking on and that I was to lead on that investigation. On the 18th of November, a boat called the Svanich had been apprehended by the UK Coast Guard and Border Force. So at the start, I was given really the sort of bare facts around the job, so all I knew was that it was a fishing trawler that had been converted. It had three crew members on board and it had 69 Albanian migrants. It was originally heading for the Great Yarmouth area off the Norfolk coast. The boat had been intercepted by border force and it had been taken into Harwich port where it had been offloaded. That number of migrants suggested the involvement of a serious organised crime group. 
the NCA launched Operation Sketchlike. So in relation to this investigation, you have a, what I would class as the core team. Um, so that core team works pretty much 24-7 on this job until it goes to court and until the, until the end of the trial, effectively. One of the key team members was Ian, who needs to remain anonymous due to ongoing undercover investigations. I'm a, an investigator with the National Crime Agency. I uh, did 30 years within the Metropolitan Police. I worked within the Metropolitan Police in a surveillance capacity and left there and I'm doing exactly the same sort of work within the National Crime Agency. The NCA needed to act fast before the OCG members went underground. So when we took the job over, obviously the migrants themselves had been offloaded and they'd been dealt with by immigration enforcement. The three crew members on board the boat, they'd been arrested. And so my initial concerns or my initial thoughts are around the three boat crew, really. The three crew were suspected lower level gang members and would hopefully provide clues about the rest of the OCG. When the crew members were initially arrested, we had very little information about them. We knew that two of them were Ukrainian and one of them was Latvian. And then it allowed us to go to the Ukraine and say, you know, has this person got any previous convictions? Are they known to your services? And in relation to all three of them, in fact, none of them had any previous convictions or had previously been in trouble with law enforcement in their own countries. Frustratingly, the three suspects refused to cooperate. A search of the vessel turned up phones and a laptop. Our immediate response was to look at the communication devices of those three crew members and also the laptops and other communication devices found on the boat. We submitted them to various laboratories. Whilst waiting for the results from the lab, the team looked at the vessel that had carried the vulnerable migrants. So the Svanik was a, a fishing trawler originally. It was built in 1963. Um, it had been converted, so it had been crudely converted inside. So the area at the front where the fish would normally be held, that had been converted into cabins. And we think the relevance of this is that obviously it allowed the um, organised crime group to put more and more people on board than would normally be inside the boat. The conversions themselves were pretty basic. Um, the facilities on board were cramped. There were 72 people if you include the crew and the 69 migrants on board. There were only 20 life jackets. All of the life jackets are out of date and so possibly wouldn't have worked properly. There was a life raft on board the boat, but again, that was five years out of date and so quite possibly wouldn't have worked had the boat um, encountered any problems and sunk. These individuals are purely driven by financial gain and they've got total disregard for the safety of these individuals that they're bringing into the UK. The team needed to stop this gang. They dug deeper into the history of the ship's movements. Prior to the boat coming to the UK, it had actually run aground in Sweden, um, and so Swedish Coast Guard had had to go and rescue the boat. Their suspicions were initially alerted because the three crew members who they spoke to separately didn't have a kind of cohesive story of where they were going on board the boat. They then fed that information into a Europe-wide agency called MAOC, which is the Marine Analysis and Operations Centre. The Spanish was tracked across Europe, where it picked up passengers and was intercepted. The scale of this smuggling operation meant the team needed to find evidence and fast. This is the largest boat investigation that's actually had a UK nexus, so that's actually ended or started in the UK. So far, there are no solid leads. Investigators put all their energies into cracking the phones and computer that were discovered on board. It was very obvious that that laptop had been used for navigation purposes. Prior to that, it had been used by one of the OCG that was based in the UK. And so that was a major breakthrough in the investigation because we were then able to sort of see the wider OCG, if you like. The computer continued giving investigators crucial intelligence. There was communication basically between the, the captain of the boat directly to the OCG talking about what the plans and what the procedures were, where they were going to pick up the migrants and um, so on and so forth. And so you, at that point you know that he's not really bonded to the OCG as such. He's actually a member of it. The OCG contact in question was a 32-year-old Latvian called Sergei Kulis. His details led us to the Metropolitan Police investigation which identified other members of the OCG. 
They'd been arrested and bailed for a, a matter of handling stolen goods. It was a huge stroke of luck. The Met gave the NCA the names of two more of the gang. Kafir Evgi, who investigators believed was the money man, and the suspected OCG boss, Arturo Ducis. They had actually seized a number of mobile phones. They shared that mobile phone data with us, and we analysed that mobile phone data. Ian was responsible for harvesting any relevant information from the OCG mobiles. We sat down and looked at the communications between these individuals. Uh, it's not for you, bro. Mistake, mistake. It's for another guy. It's bound slow and refuse it. Bro. Everything just came into place. There's extremely damning evidence on their phones, which ultimately, it, it filled in all the gaps. If their tradecraft had been better, we wouldn't have got the evidence that we got. So as soon as I heard that first message, it was, wow, this is pretty damning. Investigators looked deeper into Sergei Kulisi's travel history. It turned out that he'd been out to visit the boat, had flown out and had visited it for a couple of days. And some of the voice messages that he'd left were while he was basically on the boat, um, looking around the boat and sort of giving update to other members of the OCG. My friend have yachta. OK, no, we're going to meet soon. We're going <coughs> to talk, we're going to send you pictures. When I had the opportunity to listen to those messages, it was extremely clear and apparent what they were talking about. We're going to bring you every week 50 people. Just we need to invest now <coughs> 40,000 if you want, 20 you, 20 me. And certainly in relation to their venture of buying a boat, bringing 50 migrants in every week. From first trip, we're going to get that money back. They pay off their investment within the first week, and then they will continue to do it week in, week out afterwards. The team calculated the money involved. What they discovered was incredible. We estimated it to be in, in the region of about £15,000 per person um, to come across on that boat. So if you scale that up, 69 people, £15,000 each, you're talking in, in the region of a million pounds, effectively, on that one trip alone. Finally, the NCA had the evidence they needed to bring the gang in. Police, can you open the door? The 8th of June was a day of action, effectively. To ensure the element of surprise, the arrests were carefully coordinated. Suspected gang boss Juices was the key target. Where we had probably three separate teams, probably of about 10 people each, going to different addresses to try and arrest all three of the nationals at once. I'm here this, this morning to arrest you, all right, for the offence of conspiring to facilitate illegal entry into the UK, contrary to section 25 of the Immigration Act 1971. Okay. Juices was taken to a local police station where he was questioned. Mr Juices didn't give any information in relation to the offence that he was being investigated for. He was compliant. He talked to us. He was, I guess, maybe resigned to the fact that he'd been arrested for this matter. Despite the gang's silence, the evidence against them was damning. A year after the investigation began, the trial came to court in Chelmsford. Evge got 10 years and Kulis was given nine years for their parts in the operation. The big boss, Juices, pleaded guilty and received a reduced sentence of nine years and nine months. I mean, obviously, we're always concerned about this kind of criminality because at any stage of that process, it could have gone horribly wrong. Had the boat sunk, uh, we'd have been talking about a completely different kind of investigation. It was very satisfying for everybody involved. I think it sends out a clear message to persons uh, wishing to get involved in this sort of crime that these are the uh, sentences that you're going to get if found guilty of these offences.